I'm Yana Trafalz, and I work at the Athens Institute for Education Research, which is a world association for academics and researchers. I'd like to welcome you to Atmers in Interview Series, where we interview professors that come from around the world to our conferences. Uh, today I'm going to interview Dr. Margaret Venske, Associate Professor of History from Stetson University, USA. Hello, Dr. Venske. Welcome Hello. to Athens. Thank you. So I'd like to begin by asking you to give us a brief academic introduction of yourself. Tell us about your education career and whatever else you went on. Okay. I got my PhD from Columbia University, mm -hmm. I made, where I majored in Ottoman history. I have I've done all my teaching at liberal arts colleges, which require that you teach more broadly, mm -hmm. which has been very interesting. <laughs> you know, I can develop a variety of courses. I guess the downside is is that at times I don't have enough time for research, so there's a frustration there. Uh, but I've, you know, I so I'm now at Stetson University, where I have been for quite a number of years. You know, I taught previously for a very brief period of time at both. Loyola College, Maryland, and Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I offer a, a wide array of courses. I mean, I can't offer straight Ottoman history courses. You know, there aren't enough students at a liberal arts college who would take an array of Ottoman history. So I offer uh, courses more generally on Islamic history. So I teach an Islamic history survey, which is of interest to undergraduates. I also offer the modern Middle East, which is much more political, but that's also of great interest, obviously, in undergraduates, given what's happening today in the Middle East. But you know, it's it's difficult to go from the modern Middle East, and I, you know, I'm pretty conversant with what's going on in Syria, which is actually my research area, but in the 16th century. So you know, I go from you know what's going on today in Syria and Iraq. You know, all the way back to early Islamic history. So that's that's the type of teaching that you do at a liberal arts college. It's not specialized to your own specialization, which it, it can make teaching more interesting. But again, it, it can take away from your research time. So you said your current major area of research is Syria. It it it's always been Ottoman okay. Syria. Okay. It includes a part of southeastern Turkey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems that you have interest in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, what, why did you, what, what introduced so much in this historic period? Well, I didn't start out with the Ottoman Empire. Okay. <laughs> so I, I was going to major in the modern Middle East. Mm -hmm. So I started a graduate program at Columbia University in modern Middle Eastern history. Mm -hmm. And I got a certificate from their School of International Affairs in the modern Middle East. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, around that time too, you know, I met this old professor. I shouldn't say old. I'm getting up there myself now. But I, I met uh, Tibor Halashi Kuhn, mm -hmm. a Hungarian professor. You know, he's sort of born into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who was an Ottomanist, mm -hmm. and he sort of pulled me into the 16th century. Mm -hmm. you know, he said that Ottoman documentation is so interesting. And I liked him so very much that I, I decided, well, I think I will do Ottoman history. Oh, so I maintained my interest in Syria, but I do Ottoman Syria. That is my research area. Okay. So um, tell us about your presentation at the conference. So I uh, presented on uh, the, uh, the question of the tribal factor, the, the tribesmen or tribespeople being a factor in uh, the inability of the Syrian lands perhaps to enjoy a more complete economic recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some previous work on decline. Uh, this is my second uh, Atina uh, conference at my first one, which was in 2005. I did a paper on the decline of the Syrian lands. Mm -hmm. And I think what's been good about uh, Atener for me is, is that this conference is so broad, mm -hmm. you have to speak to a general audience. And it, it causes me to present my research in a different, con in the broader context, mm -hmm. rather than 
you know, as an Ottoman historian. And so the first paper was on decline. Uh, and, you know, I use as my perspective, you know, uh, the um, late antiquity, you know, like the, the sixth through the eighth centuries. And, you know, I've looked at some of the research that comes from those scholars. And, you know, so the issue of decline has really come to interest me. And so I, I used statistics from that period, which was a long time ago, mm -hmm. and then my, my, my own work, which is the 16th mm -hmm. century. And that century is really wonderful for Ottoman documents because the Ottomans kept these tax registers. They produced tax registers. They began to produce them. Uh, in the late 15th century, and they continued the practice through the 16th century, and then it was abandoned. But it, it's really unusual to have such records that record, you know, villages, uh, cultivated but uninhabited sites, uh, uh, the population, there's such detail. And you can't get that really for, uh, for any period of history other than the modern. Um, it, certainly in the field of, of the Middle East or even in the field of classical studies. I mean, there's some interesting cl uh, records for the classical or late antiquity, but you know, they're not comprehensive in the way that these tax registers are comprehensive. So they'll deal with a whole uh, sub-province, a uh, Lima sub-province, uh, and you know, there's such detail in them. And so um, I compare whatever statistic, uh, what, uh, I compare um, statistics produced by scholars of, of Rome and Byzantine Syria uh, with the statistics that I have come up with for Syria in the 16th century. And as I said in my presentation, you can see uh, a major population decline. I mean, the statistics for the Roman period, are, they don't rest on such solid you know, evidence. Uh, so the uh, the um, calculations based on them vary quite broadly. So as I said today in my presentation, I, I used a statistic produced more recently by David Kennedy, who estimated the population of Roman Syria in the first century to be between three and four million. And that's, that's actually a smaller estimate than previous ones that have put the population at perhaps five to six million. So I, I you know, I prefer to use actually the smaller, the smaller st statistic, and so using that sense, no one really knows, using that as a basis for comparison, and my own study of the population here in the 16th century, I have a very long article that's about ready to be presented for publication, um, and that article I, using the Ottoman tax registers, but also having to estimate. So, you, there are problems, there, there are holes in the research, and at points you do have to estimate population. So it's not totally scientific. Uh, but uh, my calculation arrived at a figure of a little under 1.5 million, and so, you know, to use the, the lower figure by David Kennedy, three million, I come up with one and a half million, actually fewer, but one, I'll say one and a half million. In the 16th century, I mean, that's a huge population loss. And I think what, what perhaps demonstrates the loss uh, more dramatically is the fact that these Ottoman tax registers uh, record uh, fields that were being cultivated but are not inhabited. And we can, most of these sites were former village sites. And I know in my own research, I mean, I can prove that many of them were former village sites mm -hmm. uh, based on early studies. So, uh, so the number of these sites are called mezras, just to indicate, to indicate cultivated areas. Um, there are about, there are almost twice the number of mezras as there were villages in Syria in the 16th century. So now all, not all of these mezras would have been inhabited sites at the same time, obviously. But nevertheless, they give you a sense that there's been great uh, depopulation. There, there's been a retraction of village life, which suggests 
um, depopulation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was actually, I dealt with some of that in my, uh, in my first paper at Achenur. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I continue to actually research along those lines. Okay. And then today's paper was entertaining the question of to what extent the tribes in the 16th century may have been impeding economic progress. Now, something like that cannot be proven. So it's not scientific. You know, you, you can suggest, you know, you can sort of suggest findings. I mean, actually, my conclusion is, is that tribes, uh, which were also helpful too, as I indicate, they're quite beneficial to the economy. We need what the tribes produce. Uh, uh, tribes, nevertheless, uh, probably were one of the factors to hold back an economic recovery. But I would say that they're only one of the factors. Mm -hmm. So I feel comfortable saying that. Mm -hmm. I cannot prove it. My, my evidence is indirect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting. So how are you introduced to Atmer and what made you to the conference? <clears throat> I'm, I was introduced through, it, surely it was an announcement for one of your conferences. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it sounded interesting um, with its emphasis on the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. I don't think of what I do as Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I put myself in this Ottoman Syria mm -hmm. context. And though I do deal with coastal Syria, I still don't think of it as Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, well, this sounds interesting, and I like Greece. So I thought, well, it's your first time in Greece. No, uh, I've been to Greece several times. Mm -hmm. First went to Greece uh, as my college graduation gift to myself. Oh, you know, nice. when I could wander around before having to find a job or do something serious. So I yes, I enjoy Greece very much. So I thought, oh, I, no, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. So I, I attended the uh, 2005 conference. Or no, the, or the the fifth conference, mm -hmm. whatever year mm -hmm. that, not 2005, the fifth conference, mm -hmm. and it enjoyed it. Uh, we, the topics were really diverse. Mm -hmm. so I found it very interesting, so I thought I'd come back nice. and then sort of pick up this idea of decline, but you know, look at the tribes to mm -hmm. suggest the extent to which they may have been responsible for failure to for these lands to recover. So what is the status of the higher education system in the U.S.? And what do you think are its advantages and its disadvantages? That's really, that's, really, <laughs> that's really a hard question. So higher education. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you could ask that of any professor. And uh, he or she would say, well, I, I sort of know my own university. Yeah, I, I can't say, you know, I mean, you're not sure you know, to what extent uh, one's own experience holds up nationally, mm -hmm. but I think to some, I think it does largely. Yeah. Uh, education has been a big topic in the United States. The concern is, is that American students are less well educated. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about this for years. Uh, President Bush, number two, George Bush, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he made education, he wanted to make education uh, a major point in his presidency. Uh, Barack Obama uh, did the same thing, he's really interested in education. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of, uh, the, the spotlight has certainly been put on it, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't think that much progress has been made. Mm -hmm. So if I mean, the, the, the problem really starts with uh, elementary school, junior high, high school, the problem starts there. Yeah. Uh, so with, at university, you deal with the students who come to you, mm -hmm. and they come out of you know, um, schools that are sometimes underperforming. Um, but it, so the problem, I, I think that there's a tendency to think that there is a quick remedy, you know, you do. And mm -hmm. I, I think the problem is just a basic problem of not really teaching students and demanding, demanding that they do well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a cultural problem mm -hmm. that uh, results in 
poor education, educational results, or poorer educational results. I, I think it's truly cultural. I mean, that's part of it. It's also, a, uh, our African American schools have traditionally been poor for the most part, mm -hmm. and that's be that's beginning to be remedied. But you know, it, it takes time. I mean, we've desegregated schools, although there has been a certain resegregation of schools too. So I mean, so we still have the problem of um, perhaps poor uh, education for minority students or a certain proportion mm -hmm. of our minority students. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's no quick fix to this, and I, there's no educational theory that I think needs to be applied. I think we should just go back to teaching the basics and being really serious about them. Mm -hmm. So our, our Catholic schools seem to do better because they don't take any nonsense and they just, and they seem to teach the basic, the basics. Mm -hmm. um, so what one sees at the university level, and I think many university professors are seeing this, is that American students do not command good written English. They can't write well. And I mean, this is, I mean, this uh, really <laughs> is very distressing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my foreign students write better English, and I know they will write better English mm -hmm. because they have learned English grammar. I mean, how else do you learn a foreign language? I know I always, I always start with the grammar and reading. Yeah. But uh, some, some years ago in the United States, apparently the decision was made uh, by, I guess, our, I don't know, the Department of Education or I don't know, a teacher's education society or something. The decision was made that English is our language after all. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have to teach the grammar. It's the kids know, I mean, it, yeah. the kids know it. Yeah. But anyone who tries to learn a foreign language knows that the written language is so, it is quite different from mm -hmm. our informal speech. It's true. And, but, but Nevertheless, I mean, apparently a lot of educators did not recognize this or fail to recognize it. Mm -hmm. So grammar is not frequently taught in uh, you know, elementary school on up. Mm -hmm. It's not taught. Yeah, I also finished school in the U.S. and I know this. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. Well, where were you? I in Oklahoma. Well, you know, I, I think Oklahoma is doing some things right in education. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, uh, that's my impression, you know. Yeah. And some, uh, yeah, some of the Oklahoma City schools seem to be doing really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the minority schools or schools where the my minority students are in the majority uh, have been doing well. So they've, they've been, they seem to be doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. But this is really distressing, and I think most Americans don't realize that this has happened uh, it, because it's not talked about. Uh, what is talked about is is that Americans don't score well in uh, mathematics or just basic arithmetic, mm -hmm. but they they never mention English language skills. Mm -hmm. So we we've produced a whole generation that doesn't that or some part of which, and it's not a small part. It could be over fifty percent mm -hmm. of which ca cannot write proper. English. They don't know where to stop sentences, they can't express themselves well, and they don't know vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, you know, uh, the iPhone has been so much fun. It's all been so much fun for students, and you, you, know, you look at students walking across the campus, they're always on their iPhones. And, yeah. they're, they're, and so the lives of students, and it begins obviously in junior high school, are taken up by these personal communications. I, I sometimes joke to my students, boy, when I was in college, I, my friends aren't, weren't as interesting as your friends must be. I mean, yeah. why do you have to constantly text a friend? When, yeah. I mean, it's just, I think our students are drowning in minutia, stuff that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They need to learn solitude and to be able to cultivate solitude. Mm -hmm. uh, many American students don't read for pleasure. So if you're not reading for pleasure, um, 
the rules of English are not being reinforced upon you. I mean, you don't have to, you know, if you read, you, you know, you know the, the music of written language, it comes into your ears. So I know when I write, you know, I'll repeat a sentence that I just wrote and, I th and I'll say, it doesn't sound right to me. Sometimes it is grammatically correct, but it just doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. And so this is what students uh, need to be able to to uh, recognize with their own language that mm -hmm. something is wrong. But so American students are so ill prepared, you know, in with language. Mm -hmm. But you know, I tell myself, well, maybe maybe it's not as important as I think. I mean, to me. You can't be educated if you you're not educated if you don't command your own language, if you can't express yourself in your own language. So I, I think some students are so poorly educated and they'll graduate from university and at, with poor English skills. Mm -hmm. you know, but perhaps it doesn't matter as much. I mean, they're oftentimes bright students. And it depends upon what what careers they follow, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps there'll be no demand on them yeah. for to produce written language, and so they'll do fine in life. Mm -hmm. But they're not reading. They don't know the, the joy of reading. Mm -hmm. So they don't, so their imaginations, I don't think, are being developed. You know, you can't see all places in the world, but you can read about them or, you know, mm -hmm. read about other cultures, read history, I, you know, whatever, whatever interests you. But students are not turned on to reading, so this is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that um, American education, to sum this up, is going and is not doing particularly well. But there are excellent urban high schools, so where students are educated well, mm -hmm. but they they may be the exception mm -hmm. rather than the rule. So it's really, it's quite concerning to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.